God, today we come before you as the people that you have called us into this faith community. And we are gathered here, hopefully like 2,000 years ago, hoping and praying that your spirit will come. I pray that this morning that your spirit will truly come into our lives and that by your power, you will transform our lives into the likeness of your son. We pray, God, that your spirit will come and give us the fire that we need to embrace life, to not be afraid of life. We pray that this morning your spirit will give us the courage to do the right thing. And most importantly, I pray, God, that your spirit will come to us so that others can see Jesus in us. That's why here this morning, we are here this morning to hear you and see you and be transformed. By the hearing of your word, by the preaching of your word, help us to understand your calling. Be with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I think that I have shared this with you in previous times, but I have to tell you, I, um, I really don't like uh, comparisons. Um, I don't like comparisons, especially when when you have a sibling or a parent who has done really well in life or in school. I don't like comparisons. I have two brothers, and uh, we're all very different. Um, different uh, perspectives of lives, different talents. Um, I'm the oldest, but I look like the youngest. Uh, they don't like that when they're told that. Uh, but then they're also taller than me. I don't like that when they tell me that. Why are you not as tall as they are? Anyway, that, so I don't like comparisons of any kind. But you know, sometimes comparisons start in a very um, innocent way. You know, oh, so, so you are the, the brother or the son of so-and-so. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, I really hope you are as smart as he was. You know, because he did really well here. You know, you have big, big shoes to fill in. So I hope you really do well. Um, and then it doesn't stop, you know, it doesn't stop, it just keeps going. Certainly, I think that most of us want to do well in life and most of us want to make our families and our friends proud of our accomplishments. But to be honest with you, sometimes living up to those expectations is nearly impossible. Now, there is a big difference when those high expectations come from someone you, that you really don't know. I mean, you all have to come to the conclusion in life that we will never please everybody, okay? So there will be times when you, someone will compare you and you will be annoyed, but then you realize, I don't really care about this person, so it's okay. You get over it. But what happens when that comparison or those expectations come from someone that you truly love? What if those expectations come from a dear friend or a colleague or a parent? Um, or a mentor. What happened when, when they think that you can do really well because you have the talents and the gifts and uh, the future, everything is great. They, they, they put these expectations on you that for them is no big deal, but for you, you think, I don't know that I can't, and I'm really afraid of disappointing you. In the last moments that Jesus spent with the disciples, just as he was preparing to, to go to die on the cross, Jesus is having what we call this Last Supper. And in the midst of that uh, conversations, I mean, conversations, I guess it was a long supper or dinner, and uh, he begins to tell the disciples all these things that he wanted them to know for sure. He tells them that he's got, he loves them. He tells them that being uh, one of his is going to be hard. He tells them not to be afraid. But in the midst of all that conversation, Jesus drops a little bit of what I would say a bomb on them. Jesus tells them, very, I would say, not, I don't think he was yelling, I don't think he, they were, he was just being himself, and he tells the disciples, I tell you the truth, whoever believes in me will be able to do what I have done. But they also will do even greater things, because I will return to be with the Father. Think about it for a second. Whoever believes in me will be able to do the things that I have done. Now, this is Jesus speaking. 
but you will also will do even greater things. Did you hear that? I mean, Jesus is telling the disciples that they will be able to do not only what Jesus did, but even more than him. All right? Think about it for a second. I'm sure that the disciples are thinking in their heads if they even were paying attention. You know, it's been this, we, we, have, we have had this amazing three years with you in which we have seen you perform miracles. We have seen you feed people out of nothing. We have seen you raise the dead. We have seen you uh, stand up against the abuse of the political and religious authorities. We have seen you all these amazing things and you are telling us that we will be able to do that, well, not only that, but even more. Now, let's talk about putting some pressure on you. Let's talk about having high expectations for someone who certainly, in the best case scenario, has struggled to stay with Jesus. Someone who has had two steps forwards, three steps backwards. Think about someone who, as they measure themselves against Jesus, they certainly can see there's no way. There's no way in heaven that I can do the things that you do. And you're telling me on the night when you're saying goodbye to us that we will do even greater things. Now, I told you, it is a very different thing when someone tells you those things and they don't know you. But when someone loves you and knows you and tells you that you can do great things, they set high expectations for you. That's, that's really scary. I want you now to fast forward with me a little bit more of 50 days since that conversation that Jesus had with the disciples. 50 days since Jesus uh, told them that they were going to do great things even more than him. 50 days after a lot of amazing things have happened, not only Jesus was uh, crucified and died on the cross, but then on the third day he rose, and then uh, for a period of time, Jesus appeared to the disciples, talked to them, came in the midst of their uh, closed doors. This is a Jesus that uh, even had breakfast with them on the beach. I mean, this was an amazing time. Jesus came back. And finally, this all concluded with Jesus going up to heaven on what we call Ascension Sunday. And he goes up to heaven and says, just go to Jerusalem and wait for me, for the Spirit will come. And so they go to Jerusalem 50 days to the celebration of Pentecost, which was this festival that started as a celebration of uh, God's provision uh, in the new promised land. It was a festival where people would bring the first fruits of their, their labor and their crops and uh, as a sign of gratitude to God for liberating them from Egypt. But also, this Pentecost turned into a celebration of the giving of uh, the law in Mount Sinai when Moses went up to, to the mount and received the Ten Commandments and all these instructions from God. It was a wonderful time, a festival, Pentecost, which means in Greek 50. It was a time where 50 days after the Passover, they were gathering to celebrate. So the disciples are there not only out of religious duty because they're still Jews, but also because Jesus told them to go there and wait and pray. Jesus tells them, the Spirit will come. Go pray and wait. And so on the day, so on the day of Pentecost, 50 days, he's, they are gathered, they are praying, and suddenly... In the midst of their weight, the Holy Spirit comes down on them. I don't think that I can be as dramatic as I would want to. I'm not an actor. But I can just imagine the amazing moment that that was where the scripture says that there was a, a big roar from the sky coming down on them like a wind. And the whole house where they were gathered just shook, I guess, with this amazing sound. And then uh, like a flame appeared, dividing them into uh, smaller flames and setting them on them, on each other, like the Spirit coming on them. And, and people were filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and then they started speaking in languages that they didn't really know. Better than Rosetta Stone, you know, you don't have to sit in front of a computer to. These people just started to speak language fluently. 
So much that the people who were listening to them, they thought, how do they know that language? You know, how, how, how did they get there? They're doing this crazy stuff. Are they drunk? What is happening? But in the midst of that coming, there was one thing that was truth and that they needed maybe to remember. That the promise that Jesus made to the disciples, that they will do greater things than Jesus, on the day of Pentecost began. God's Spirit came down on the people on Pentecost, and we can safely say that the history of humankind was changed. God gave birth to Christ's universal church with the powerful coming of God's Spirit, and the church was born, and each individual believer received this Spirit and this fire in their, in their hearts, that they were willing to do amazing things for Jesus. And as the believers received the Spirit after having this relationship with Christ, now God gave them each talents, gifts, so that together in the fellowship of this new faith community, they, they could go into the world and do the work of Christ together. They were ready to be used in the service for Jesus. And as German theologian Jürgen Moltmann put it, in the kingdom of the Spirit, everyone will experience his and her own endowment, and all will experience the new fellowship together. The church then became the place where, where people came together. They recognized the gifts of the Spirit and went out into the world serving others. And they finally realized that the promise was going to become true, that all flesh, all people receive the Spirit of God to enable them to do the work that they were called to do. Now, I mean, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. But what did the coming of the Spirit mean in practical ways in the lives of the disciples? Well, you know, for those of us in this, in this time of age when we are so interested and base the value of things purely in numbers, it is really hard maybe to answer that question for what that meant in the lives of the disciples. Yet, the book of Acts tells us that after the coming of the Spirit, there were massive conversions, amazing miracles, and lives transformed by God's Spirit and the love of Christ. We can truly say that after the coming of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit became the dominant reality in the life of the early church. The Holy Spirit became the guide and the sword of the day-to-day -day courage and power, the Christian courage to meet dangerous situations, the power to face life more than adequately, and the joy that didn't depend on what was going on in their lives. In other words, the Holy Spirit helped the disciples with the high expectations that Jesus had put on them. And the words of Jesus became true. I tell you the truth. Whoever believes in me will be able to do what I have done. But they also will do even greater things. Because I will return to be with the Father. You see, we just don't celebrate Pentecost because it was a wonderful moment in history and that was the end of it. We just don't celebrate Pentecost because if you have a red tie, you get a chance to wear it. That's not why we only celebrate Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost but because the promise that Jesus made to the disciples is too true for them. And it stands true for us today. C.S. Lewis once said, In Christ, a new kind of man and woman appear. And the new kind of life which began in him is to be put into us. We retell the story of Pentecost each year because we need to be reminded that 
with and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we, the church, can actually be an alternative to the way of the world. We can become that kind of new man and woman that C.S. Lewis was talking about. I went recently to, to, to see a movie, and I don't know if you have been in, in a time when they, they do want to, that. I was so lucky that that day they wanted to uh, try like... Um, they were trying to do like a rehearsal of what it would happen if there was a real fire. Have you been in one of those situations? You know, in school, do you do that at school all the time? Yeah, the fire drill, you've been, okay. So there was a fire drill. I don't know why. I was so lucky that that was the day. <laughs> and um, so they told us when someone yells fire, you need to move. And they tell you, you do it, don't push each other, don't run over each other, just, just look where the exits are and just go out. Because everyone has to move. Everyone needs to go outside of the theater as soon as possible. Well, I was thinking of Pentecost. And I thought, I think that what, what happened on Pentecost is that God was yelling fire to the people in the church. And then, because they heard fire, everyone had to move. And so they went out, taking with them the light of Christ into the darkness that existed, thus creating the church. Let me just tell you something. Today, God is yelling fire to you and to me. And the question is, are we moving? Are we carrying the bright light of the fire into the darkness of the world? Or maybe I should take back my question and ask you a question before that. Is the fire in your life? Is the spirit of Christ in your life calling you to do greater things? Because if not, you came to the right place. Today, the spirit of God not only has brought you here to be sitting on those pews, but it also has brought you to transform your life and to help you in the new journey that you're about to begin. Today is not only a celebration for those who are graduating, but for all of us who can start by receiving the fire of God and getting ready to go into the world and do the work of Christ. Happy Pentecost. Let us pray. Jesus, we're very thankful. We're very thankful that you called us into this fellowship of believers. This fellowship that you call the church. And it is within this fellowship that you're also calling us to a new life. A new life in which, by which we're going to open our hearts and our minds to allow your, your spirit to be the dominant force. where we would allow the Holy Spirit to be the source of the day-to-day -day courage and power that we need. You're calling us today to allow your Holy Spirit to give us the faith to, to face those dangerous situations, those uncertainties, so that we not only will face life adequately, but with power. We're here today to receive your spirit so that that joy that goes beyond our circumstances, that does not depend on the financial markets, will give us that joy that will help us to continue to serve you even when we, even when we sometimes don't get what we want. Come, Spirit. Come, Spirit, into our lives. 
and make us new men and new women. The past and your life in our lives so the world can take a good look at who you are in us. Thank you once again. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.